All right, everybody, we have a very familiar face joining us again on Talking Engagement. Gareth Worley, you've kindly come back. Hi, Ben. Good to be back. Absolutely. Well, we were just saying before we hit record, uh, we're coming up to six months since we last recorded, well, since we recorded our last episode uh, together. And um, what a six months it's been, eh? Unreal. One, the fact that it's been six months almost is is literally beyond me. I'm, in some ways, it feels <clears throat> like it was 10 minutes ago. Mm. And then in other ways, think about how much water has gone under the bridge since then, how lives have been changed, probably irreversibly in many cases, both professionally and personally. I think this year will will go down in the history books for sure. And it, yeah, I don't think people are going to look back very very favorably on, on 2020. I, I, I always want to put a bit of a positive spin on it, you know, and you think about, you know, what can you take from this that, as I say, is a positive thing. So, you know, what have you learned that you can apply? What have you been able to throw away that wasn't working that's made you productive or more happy or whatever it might be? And, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I've mentioned it uh, in on the show uh, earlier, for by the time this one comes out is that, you know, I, I had a little bit of time on, on furlough. Um, and you know, it was all about positivity throughout that. You can view it as something that's happening to you, or you can view it as something that is just a part of your life. And, you know, you have new parameters in, in which to operate. So I think I've told you before, man, you know, I, um, I focused on things like maintaining an exercise routine, making sure that I was still eating right, that I wasn't, you know, drinking and eating pizza and sleeping in till two in the afternoon, as tempting as all those amazing things are, (laughs) Um, you know, and just kind of making sure that I tried to stay as like mentally healthy and and physically healthy as I could so that when I did get the call to come back, there'd be a good um, human being coming back to work, you know, not like this freaked out, anxious, embittered person who, you know, wouldn't essentially be able to do, do the job anymore. And I, I mean, there's been so many different experiences, right? And obviously we've, we've spoken a few times in the intervening period and I've had friends myself who've been in the similar situation of furlough. Personally, I've been very fortunate. And as you know, I was a more or less full-time home worker before anyway. Um, and so on the face of it, nothing dramatically needed to change for me. One thing that did change that was my other half was suddenly working from home. Um, and having to use headphones instead of just being on speaker the whole time was a very minor change. Um, But I think also just experiencing everyone else's experience of the pandemic and everything that ensued. Um, And then in the world of diversity and inclusion, obviously then overlaying that with um, the the huge outpouring of, um, you know, empathy and even outrage mm-hmm. around Black Lives Matter after the mm-hmm. death of George Floyd. So I think, you know, that it, it's been a, a year and a half for sure. Um, but I think, yeah, you know, talking about engagement, I think I feel personally very fortunate that I'd done a lot of investment in myself before this all happened. You know, we talked about last time how I'd sort of really, truly discovered mindfulness and built that habit, um, how I'd really started to, you know, try and be a bit more empathetic and compassionate towards myself. And I, and I think that's served me very well. And to be honest, I think it's served other people that I interact with often pretty well as well. I think, you know, if you, whatever you were faced with in this situ- in this set of situations over the last five or six months, I think the people who've been able to look at it with, um, with more of a mindful approach have certainly sort of come out of it better. And I think you're definitely one of them based on what you told me. That's very, thank you. Very kind of you. I, I'm hoping it, it comes across. I mean, I think that it's, it's one of those things, right? When you, you know, you have this version, this vision of somebody, like when you hear somebody say like, I'm working on myself, you're like, oh, so you're just thinking about yourself and what's good for you and all that kind of thing. But you make the good point there, man, is like, you know, when we work on ourselves, we make ourselves much better people to interact with, to be in a relationship with, to work with, to live with, whatever it might be. Um, and so, you know, it isn't an entirely like, what's that word that everyone likes? Nebulous act, right? It is like, there is still a, a sort of socially minded element to it. I mean, that was one of the things, you know, certainly when I was out, um, when I was out of work, it was like, you know, maybe I'm gonna like kick my counseling up a little bit, stop being so kind of um, casual with it, because I knew that 
there were little bits of myself that needed like, well, I mean, you know, I, I'm sure in the grand scheme of things, I'm an incredibly privileged position compared to what a lot of people are going through. Um, but, you know, I needed to work on stuff like self-esteem, for example. So I was just like, how can we spend six weeks now that I have the luxury of time, you know, working on stuff like that so that when I come back, I'm a more like confident individual, you know, and, and that sort of serves you well if you're in a, if you're in anything like a customer facing role or even just from a productivity standpoint, believing in yourself as being somebody who's now capable to do stuff, you stand a much better chance of accomplishing what you're after, you know? That, that's absolutely it. And I, I've been giving that advice to anybody that will listen, whether it's been friends, colleagues, or <laughs> Joe Blogs who I've bumped into. <laughs> Joking aside, you know, I think... Um, I think we we all have had struggles in our lives. Forget about 2020 for a minute, right? Everybody struggles at one point in life and, and how we deal with that and how we grow from it is is important. Many of us like you and I have, you know, inherent privileges that mean some of the reasons we've struggled are not because of fundamental aspects of ourselves compared to other people. Um, but I think whatever your struggles are, it's important to recognize them for what they are and not to feel like you're not allowed to deal with them, that you're not allowed to spend time focusing on processing them and getting over them. Um, and I think it, it can feel, you know, so for me, like the big thing was, you know, suddenly we were restricted to one outdoor exercise a day. And this is somebody who would, you know, yes, go to the gym, but then also walk the dog two, three, four times a day and pepper that into my routine quite naturally. To suddenly be allowed to go out once a day, I was like, ah, oh, man, let's a completely rethink my working day so that I could get a good break at a point in time where it really did break up the day, but it was still early enough to get the dog exercise when she needed it and whatever. Mm -hmm. So that actually led to a realisation for me that while I'm, I still wouldn't say that I'm a morning person, two or three hours of really focused work in the morning when you've not been up for very long, if you can do it, for me is an amazing, amazing discovery. I've literally never done that before. And it's something that I've continued long since that restriction has, has been lifted. Um, equally, having the discipline of taking a two hour break after that and doing the dog walk and the lunch and whatever else, and then really coming back focused for the rest of the working day has been amazing. And, it, and it's sort of the pattern that I'm now working even you know, beyond the restriction. So that's a very minor example of a struggle, overcome a discovery and a, and a new way of doing things that's allowing me to, to actually feel um, more in control and therefore more engaged. Yeah, I mean, it really is that sort of necessity is the mother of invention type thing, you know, and it's, you know, I think that even, you know, organizations who maybe don't have let's say, I'm not the capacity that isn't very kind, but you know, like organizations who maybe would be a little bit reticent to embrace kind of more radical thinking or something like that. I mean, it just goes to show that there's, there's lots of little things that you could implement even just from a like conversation, you just to say to your teams, like, you know, the working conditions in which we find ourselves have changed now, you know, is there an opportunity for to find you know greater flexibility in your day? For example, is there an, a case to be made for, you know, using your commuting time, to do a little bit of, you know, to do a little bit of extra work, not extra work, but to do work at a different time that allows you to be free at the other times. I mean, one of this whole thing about, you know, the government stance, not to get political, but the, this idea that everybody needs to, you know, get back to work. I mean, first of all, we've all been working, you know, it's just, we haven't been in the, well, I've not been, I've had four months off essentially, but you know, it, <laughs> it was different, but um you know, like people have still, largely speaking, people have still been working, they just haven't been in the office. And I don't know, but, you know, the idea that, you know, the high street or coffee shops or whatever need us to be working nine to five in order to fulfill their commercial, you know, requirements or whatever. Like, if you're working more flexibly, surely that's better for barbers that you can go out in the middle of the day and get a haircut than having to try and cram an entire week's worth of people into a Saturday. I, I, I don't know. Oh, I mean, between five and seven in the evening. Yeah, yeah. or whatever yeah. it is, you know. I, it, it just, I keep thinking, like, well, surely flexible is better because you can go out and do things now a little bit more freely. You can. I mean, I think there's so many lenses through which you can look at this, right? And I, so, you know, my personal passion, which is, recently converted into my professional purpose as well, is all about improving working lives and giving people a better employee experience. So I start with the individual first and that, and that I firmly believe that if the individual 
is having a positive experience, a lot of which is driven by a sense of inclusion, they're actually going to be doing better for the business, regardless of whether they're in the office or somewhere else. And I've always thought that, regardless of pandemic. And I've been fortunate over 15 years plus to have the flexibility during most of my career to kind of prove that point to myself if to no one else. Um, but I think, you know, there, there are realities of some jobs that require a person to be in a place. And then there are realities of some organisations that are just a little bit stuck in the mud in terms of it's not the way we do it. And I think I can get on board with that to a certain extent, but I think if you flip it back to the inclusion lens and if you flip it back to everybody is a complex set of characteristics that come together into a unique person that needs to feel a sense of belonging. Like that individual has all sorts of different needs in their life and work is only a small part of that. The workplace gets the best out of that person when they're really able to do everything in their life to the best of their ability. And so if by placing restrictions on the location in which work happens and the time during which work happens, unnecessarily, if there, if there truly is the option of flexibility, just think organisations are really missing a trick. Now, to take it to the other end of the spectrum from a commercial standpoint, we've got to be honest, there are city centres that are still next to empty. And there are businesses with branches after branches after branches of businesses that rely on footfall and rely on people traveling into a city, going to an office and traveling home from the city. And they're not doing very well. That's a dynamic that we need to work through. I haven't got a solution to that, but let, let's not forget that there's many, many businesses that have that, that reliance on our footfall. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's all over the place. I agree. I mean, I, there are a lot of different different ways that you can look at it, and I would be very um, skeptical of anyone who who pretends that they have the answers. Right? It's it's you know it's it's a very subjective and and potentially like specific thing to each organization. And I'm certainly you know not saying that there is no place for the office anymore. I mean, for for people who aren't watching this on on YouTube when it comes out. Um, you know, I am in the office, and the reason that I'm in the office is because there's better internet in Newcastle city center than there is in the Northumberland countryside where I live. You know, I enjoy having a little bit of separation between, you know, church and state. And, you know, when it comes to <laughs> being in these walls where work happens and psychologically, I'm a little bit more tuned into what it is that I'm doing. I don't have any distractions. There isn't a fridge here that I can keep putting me greedy face in every half an hour and everything like that. So, you know, I totally understand that there will be some people for whom, you know, working from home is a trigger for anxiety. It's a trigger for loneliness. It's a trigger for distractions. You know, perhaps you're in a, you know, I've, I've heard about people who, you know, live in a flat share and, you know, their desk is an ironing board and, you know, or they just have to be in bed all day. You know, you're working for, and, you know, I mean, from a sleep hygiene perspective, you do not want to be, you know, so starting to associate your bed with somewhere where you work, you know, it should be somewhere where you completely unplug from all that kind of stuff. Totally. So we I, all have enough trouble switching off from the day. 100%. in bed anyway regardless of having spent the day in bed as well yeah totally yeah so i mean you know is there a place for the office in the future of course there is you know is it going to be a communal working space very possibly is it going to become more of a social space you know because where else do you kind of have those moments of magic that happen you know in the kitchen or when you bump into somebody in the corridor or you know a new starter you know you happen to you know, maybe you started an organize, you know, started a business and, you know, you hear somebody mention a football team, you happen to support that football team, you know, and then you've instantly got that rapport with somebody, for example, you know, you, you can't manufacture instances like that over a Zoom call, um, especially now where we are, you know, appreciating the irony that this is a Zoom call, completely saturated with Zoom calls. Do you know what I mean? It's, um, it, it, I do. It's and, and, I, and, I, and you're right. I think the, the ad hoc interaction that is what creates those magical moments in workplaces. You have to be so incredibly intentional and so incredibly creative mm -hmm. to get anywhere close to that. Um, hands down, the best meeting of my week is our 15-minute quick chat team meeting with no agenda like we mm -hmm. literally just something comes up we howl with laughter we spend 15 minutes together and then we go on and like get on with the day 
Now, I've spoke to HR people in a lot of organisations during the lockdown and they've struggled to find those like kinds of opportunities and to do it um, consistently across an organisation is, is nigh on impossible. I think what it, what it does highlight is, yes, the importance of the, the role of the people manager as pastoral as much as, you know, task oriented. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also the role of everybody in an organisation as a human being. I think my own point of view is that organisations typically place far too much at the feet of people managers. And I think especially during times of crisis, you know, just basically people managers have been in charge of looking after their team's mental health. That is a tall order. I mean, that is a big ask. Um, but I think the, the, the other thing that I've, I've, I've observed, if I can get my words out, is people who are not managers, people who are just, as I say, human beings, stepping up to look out for each other. And actually that takes some of the burden off managers to allow managers to get on with managing. Um, and I would love to see organisational cultures develop more in that direction. Everybody leads leadership, needs, goodness me, I'm struggling today. Everybody (laughs) needs leadership, absolutely. We need vision, we need direction, Mm -hmm. we need to know that we're on the right track, we need to know where we stand, etc. No argument. But does a manager have to do all of the things that we've traditionally asked a manager to do? And in recent times, those extra things that we've automatically Mm -hmm. required them to do versus building organisational cultures that make it more of a... Um, a communal responsibility, I can you know, see that. To, and, for each other's well-being. Yeah, and and do you think that that comes with? Do you think it it, it kind of then becomes kind of? I suppose it's a bit of a catch-22 in a way, because I, I would say that to that, it probably becomes incumbent on the organization to empower the people outside of the leadership roles by virtue of their culture to sort of take that extra level of responsibility. But I could totally see an organization turn around to that point and say, well, yeah, that's what our managers are supposed to do. They're supposed to be the ones empowering and embedding this culture. So it's, um, I mean, I, I, mean, I resonate it comes with down that. To, it comes down to culture completely. And it comes down to the kinds of behaviors that you make it clear as an organization are important. Let's talk about empowerment for a minute. So you might have heard me say this before, but you as an organization cannot empower people. You as a manager cannot empower people. You can create a space and an environment where people feel empowered. It's the individual's choice as to whether they feel empowered or not. Right. So to my mind, it comes back to, it's the same, the same concept of engagement. You can't engage people. <laughs> you can create a situation in which they choose to be engaged. And I think that's a, a fundamental way that we've got to sort of think about the workforce is, are we creating an environment and experience where these things happen and where people don't think, oh, well, that's not my job. Mm. Right. Not my job syndrome is the worst enemy of any organization because you don't go through people sitting in their box and doing their own thing. That's true. That's true. I think um, one of the things that in terms of kind of talking about like comms and things like that, something that sort of through the prism of my own experience, like it radically changes on a, on a, depending on how I'm feeling sort of the, the, the ways and the, the frequency in which I want to be communicated with, you know, like there's some days I really enjoy my, you know, my 9am stand up every single day. And I think, oh, you know, I've got lots to contribute to this. It'd be interesting to hear what other people are saying. But other times, I mean, you know, say for example, if it is a rare day where I've been in the office, you know, where the 9am isn't the first thing I'm doing, you know, I might've been in a little bit earlier, you know, at like eight or whatever. And it's like, it comes right in the middle of what I'm trying to achieve. It's like, it's a, it can be quite an unwelcome break from like a flow state, you know, like if you're into it and I feel like, you know, I, I so it, yeah, I mean, that's maybe where I would need to empower myself to say, you know, is it okay if I tap out of this one? I just need to focus on this, that, or the other, you know, and you don't feel like you're necessarily being a bad team member or whatever, just by virtue of not wanting to participate maybe one time or, or whatever it might yeah. be. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, there's a big part of creating the kind of environments that I'm talking about mm-hmm. that comes down to people having the latitude and the choice to make decisions like that, whether it's about, do I attend a particular meeting? Do I join a particular call? Do I engage in a particular project? Sometimes 
there are jobs, we all know this, there are jobs where you can't create a lot of choice. But even the smallest amount of choice and control that you can, can create for the individual and the latitude even for them to, you know, make mistakes and try things out um, in their own way, they're all things that will create that sense of empowerment that we're, that we're seeking and that we're talking about. Um, you know, I'm constantly grateful for the amount of whiteboarding space that I have in my working day. I create the space for it in the calendar, but I'm also afforded the space to actually do it and to think by virtue of the job that I do, the boss yeah. that I have, the team that I work in, the nature of the work, yeah. all of those things come together very nicely for me. What that means is latitude is huge, but the accountability that comes with that is huge as well. And I think that's the flip, the flip side of empowerment, right? So you, you, you probably wouldn't have to Google for very long to find case studies of organizations where everybody's empowered, but there's no accountability. And so really mm. nothing gets done. <laughs> that, that's the flip side of what we're talking about. And I think that the, the cheeky kind of careful balance is creating the environment where accountability is, is almost as, as important as the empowerment that we're all kind of seeking for. You know? mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I think it, it really kind of, a lot of it as well, it, it, to me anyway, it seems like it ties into the direction in which we're going, you know, by virtue of, you know, working more remotely, working more flexibly, you know, kind of this, this concept of the, the hybrid working environment, like wherever that's going to be. I think that the majority of people that I'm speaking to, or that I see on LinkedIn or read about in the paper or whatever, despite what, you know, kind of the, I guess the news media is telling us is that there is a larger clamor to work more independently, to kind of have that extra flexibility inside um, your role and the type of work that you're doing. And I think that most people would accept, most reasonable people anyway, would accept that that does come with an added level of accountability, with an added level of, um, yeah, you know, well, accountability, I think is probably the best word, just enable to, to sort of say like, look, if I'm asking you to let me work some slightly more customized hours, I'm at least going to be beholden to the outputs of my role, right, of the things that I need to do. Otherwise, you know, you, you know, I would struggle to defend anybody who wanted stuff just because, you know, people who could actually say, okay, I can be trusted with this responsibility and here's how I'm going to, you know, consistently demonstrate that, that I'm worthy yeah. of that trust, right? Yeah, yes, to an extent. So I think you should always start with trust as hard as that sometimes is. Mm -hmm. start, with tr start with trust and let people unearn it rather than expecting people to earn it from the start. Yeah. Because we're all, as I like to say, grown ass human beings. And, you know, to, to, to the point that you've made, if we're held accountable to the outcomes of our labors, it reduces the focus on the inputs. Like, you, the hours in which I did the work are less important than the quality of the work that I produced. Yeah. The place in which I did the work is less important than the quality of the work that I produced. But let's also recognize that there's always a spectrum with everything. And there are many, many people in this world who still thrive on your commute in nine to five commute home kind of job. And so while we would definitely hear in and the media would have, a, have us believe everybody's clamoring for more flexibility, We've all learned all of this stuff now as organizations that we can't unlearn, we can't unknow that overnight we could switch from nobody working from home to everybody working from home. Like you, you literally can't. But let's not forget that that's not right for everybody. And actually coming back to choice and latitude and the future of the office, like I would hate to think that all of these big statements that some organizations have made about we're going to close down the 7,000 person headquarters. I'm like, Okay, but like, let's think about what does that mean for some really critical people in your organization who have their own individual needs and preferences and their own way of feeling a sense of belonging in the organization and their own sense of um, being in control and their own sense of this is how I work best to get the job done. Like, it's not all about sitting on the roof terrace and spending two hours in a cafe. Like, that doesn't work for a hell of a lot of people. So let's not, let's not get carried away by this whole thing. I mean, yeah, and I, I think that it would, it, for me anyway, from in, in my world, you know, decisions like that, you know, should be informed by the opinions and the, the voices of, of your people, right? I think that if that's, you know, before you make these wholesale organizational changes, it would be beneficial to at least kind of float your hypothesis 
to your organization and kind of see what the level of favorability it would be met with. Yeah. And maybe you don't need a 7,000 person headquarters anymore. Or maybe you still need those some spaces for people to work in and for people to gather when they choose to. Mm -hmm. And for some people that might be five days a week. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, I mean, even in you know, my own personal circumstances, if suddenly they went, right, there is no office anymore. I'd be like, I didn't apply for a job that was home-based. Do you know what I mean? Like, could I adapt? Could I make the best out of it? Yes, I'm sure I could, but would it be something that I would have, you know, if I could have gone back and chosen, but perhaps not, do you know what I mean? So, well, and then, and then the onus is on you. So you say make the best of it, but the onus of, of, of the situation then is on you mm -hmm. to enable the organization to get the best out of you. Like, did you see what I mean? Like the relationship yeah. and the and the onus is flipped in that situation because even if that is not what you signed up for and it's not the way you work best and it's not the way to get the best out of you, it's imposed on you to still deliver the best that you can back to the organisation. That's hard. It is hard, and and it, and yet you you know came so naturally out of my mouth. Do you know what I mean? It's like one of those things where do you think? <laughs> I mean, is that something? This is a big question, Gareth, but do you think that's something that sort of generally speaking needs to be unpicked a little bit more in sort of the, the general consciousness of the employee? Oh, we're going philosophical, are we? Oh. I mean, I just, it just occurred to me. I just thought maybe that could be a, you know. I, so I, forgive me if we talked about this during the first episode that we recorded <laughs> together because I can't remember. I do remember having a conversation with somebody about this at one point. So I had a, a realization at some point this year, this like epiphany moment that mm. the entire construct of work is basically predicated on lies. So okay. you, you create this version of yourself on paper in the form of a CV, a resume, that you give to organizations to impress them to take the best version of yourself. And if they're interested, you go to an interview and it's all on you to prove that that best version of yourself on paper is the best version of yourself in reality. And then if you're lucky enough to be offered the job and then you turn up on the first day, you basically take off your real life coat at the door and you walk in and you perpetuate the best, of, the best version of you lie for the rest of your working career. I'm being dramatic, obviously. <laughs> like if we, if we can chip away at that veneer and by the way, I think lockdown has done this for a lot of people quite naturally. If we can really open up some of the real me and less of the fake best version of me in the workplace, not just during a crisis, but as an ongoing behavioral shift, then I think we'll unpick that quite naturally. So, <coughs> excuse me. So if you think about um, February, right? So the pandemic, the, the, coronavirus existed it was in mm. different parts of the world there were maybe a handful of cases in the uk nobody had any concept of what was about to happen so people were still going about their lives with the the veneer of lies on them when they went to work <coughs> mid late march the switch is flicked there's a lot of people now suddenly in front of a computer at home using video conferencing pretty much all day, every day for the first time. Mm -hmm. They never did it before and suddenly they're doing it all the time. They've got windows into each other's lives, homes, pets, kids, families, situations. And actually they've been always on. That, ne that, that level of intensity never existed before. It's physically impossible for a human to live through that level of intensity with that veneer fully intact, just no way. Whether it's as basic as, I've not had time to do my hair today, obviously a big problem for me. <laughs> or whether it's like my kid's having an absolute meltdown that I'm just gonna be on my lap during this call and I'm gonna stay on mute because he's crying his head off. Mm -hmm. Like that stuff never happened before. Even in businesses where people did work from home, the veneer was still on. The veneer to a large extent is gone. So if you then think about that in the context of what I was saying to you before, like you flip in the onus on yourself mm. to get the best out of yourself on behalf of the company. Like that, that, that construct has already started to break because of the breaking of the veneer through the lockdown. The risk 
is that organizations try to go back to normal and therefore they reconstruct the veneer on everybody by default because then all of the realness all of the flexibility all of the um emotional connection all of the opportunity to be more cohesive as pairs of individuals as small teams even you know bigger parts of organizations where this new environment has created this level of intimacy right we just we just we just can't go back to how that was but likewise we also need to find a new way of being because i don't feel like what we've landed with is sustainable either and actually i feel like we're probably at risk of a new kind of veneer appearing mm -hmm. which is the zoom fatigued veneer mm -hmm. of I'm always on camera because I feel like I should. I'm always smiling through gritted teeth because I feel like I should. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, yes, it might be intimate. And yes, I might be sharing more than I did before. And my kid might be in the background. But my new veneer is, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. um, and it, so there's lots of, lots of nuance to this and lots of um, potential risk to try and get ahead of. I would argue that there's as much for the individual to do to get ahead of it as there is for organizations to do. Yep. Because again, coming back to latitude and choice, it's a place in which you could apply that latitude and choice. Because this is, this, is this is what my blank slate, this is what I'm gonna draw on my blank slate with my piece of chalk. Yeah, so it's like you are going from an you're going from a place where you kind of felt like you didn't necessarily have the flexibility and freedom to choose how you wanted to act. You maybe do have a lot more of that flexibility and choice now. And what you don't want to do is just kind of move into the next like herd of people who are just kind of smiling their way through what is a very intense and overwhelming situation. Exactly, and and I would argue it's as, so as much for the people like me whose organisations are still very much like you know we're at home till the new year like nothing's changing we're not going back to the office no pressure there's other organizations that are at the other extreme where they literally can't have people working from home they just can't yeah. and so you're back at work and that that presents its own challenges and opportunities for people to think well how do i want to interact with that it's in the middle where it gets really tricky where organizations are saying we want you back and actually the uk government is saying we want people back and the individual is saying, I ain't ready for that version of the new normal yet. Mm -hmm. And I may never be. And the real rub and the real space for negotiation, friction, conflict, I think is in those, in those kinds of organizations where the push from the company is stronger than the pull from the employee. And, I, and I, that, that worries me in the sense that, you know, there are, it almost feels inevitable that there is going to be like, you're going to reach a situation where you can't really compromise anymore. And there's going to be, you know, potentially good people um, whose circumstances are preventing them from being able to carry on in, in jobs that, I mean, I bet, you know, in the worst case scenario, people, you know, can't do jobs they enjoy anymore. People do jobs that they were, you know, perfectly suited for and all that kind of they stuff. They would I mean, otherwise want to do, but yeah. feel unable to do now. Yeah. 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 I think, um, I mean, again, you know, uh, you know, sort of uh, rose tinted specks of mine, it, you know, it just, it, it comes down to, a, a part of it comes down to communication, you know, and I, I think trying to keep those, those, those channels open as much as you possibly can and, and being, I guess like, you know, you've both got to be as understanding as you possibly can, you know, because yeah, I think there's, you know, somebody made the good point to me. I was talking to, um, I was talking to, to, to David Blackburn at the FSCS the other day, and he was talking about sort of what it was like to be part of a, a people team during this. And he was saying, you know, you have to be, you know, you have that pastoral responsibility. You still, you know, you're kind of trying to be somebody's comrade, someone's confidant, somebody's, you know, therapist, somebody's, you know, whatever else it might be. And of course, all the time that you're doing this for other people, you know, your holiday is being cancelled, your partner, you know, their job might be at risk. You can't, you know, yes. you, you know, get out and walk the dog, whatever it might be, you know. And so it's such a nuanced job you know and a lot of responsibility to try and juggle in the sense that you're 
you know, I think, it, you know, you see this a lot on LinkedIn, you know, kind of people rightfully making the point that, you know, all these people in HR and people roles and all that kind of stuff right now, you know, they've really been pushed to the fore in the same way that your financial department was probably pushed to the fore during 2007, 2008, right? It was all, it was all in finance there and spotlights well and truly on, on HR and people now. And yet, you know, these people, people, they're still people. Do you know what I mean? They're all going through it as well. So, you know, who, who is, who's, who's the H, who, who's the HR to HR? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, no, I, I, exactly right. And I think what, unfortunately, what we will see, and this is absolutely inevitable, is that that pressure will increase even further because there's no end of businesses that won't survive beyond the end of the job retention scheme in the UK and yeah. similar schemes in other countries. And there will be businesses that go under or make significant reductions to their workforce and it's the senior leaders but it's largely the people that deliver that kind of change my headphones have just run out of battery can you hear me i, I could still hear you yeah okay cool <laughs> um and i and i think in all of these circumstances there's a real need for businesses and business leaders to lead with clear, honest, open communication about purpose and about the why. Mm -hmm. If employees are being dragged back to the office without understanding what's leading to the drag, and there may well be a good business reason which isn't being communicated well, that's going to lead to far more people choosing to say the same the place for me anymore than it would do if it was just like, okay, I get it. Likewise, in the case of, you know, restrictions and redundancies and all of these things that we'll see, you know, the people function has to execute on what is essentially a business case for doing it. And again, purpose and why goes a long way to doing that. The people profession is incredible. You know, I count myself um, humbled to be a member of it for so many years and to have seen so many situations where HR has really had to step up and, and deliver stuff like this. Never have I seen anything like 2020 in, you know, the almost 20 years that I've been in the workforce in this kind of work. Um, so, yeah, I think if, um, if there's a, a parting word, um, it's sort of stay strong to all my colleagues in the HR profession because um, we need to look after each other and, you know, it's... It's it's going to get harder before it gets easier for many of us, unfortunately. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think that's a really nice, uh, I think that's a really nice note to leave it on. I mean, you know, maybe it, it's, you know, it is going to get worse before it gets better, but I think that at the very least, like at the end of this, there will be a lot of, a lot of valuable learnings that we can apply to, you know, future management of, of other hopefully not so drastic crises, you know? Yeah. My one, my one final thought then is, at the beginning of the pandemic, I saw a real increase in empathy, humanity, inclusive leadership, both inside my own organisation and I observed it elsewhere as well. Uh -huh. And I think that sentiment of remember you're a human could be very easily forgotten if we're not intentional about retaining it. And I think despite all of this, we all remain humans um, and, and that that's been so powerful and that's one thing that we can't lose from all of this. Yeah. Keep the humanity and uh, hopefully everything will be all right in the end. Yeah. Cool. Right. Well, Gareth, thank you again for, uh, for joining me on the show. Always great to have you on. I look forward to doing this again soon. Cheers, Ben. Thanks. Lovely. Speak soon. Cheers. Cheers.